Okay, so hello everyone, good evening. I'm uh, Kthir, I'm the Chief Scientist at BASIS Technology. Um, and uh, just a few words about BASIS. Um, we're based in, um, in Cambridge, MA, um, and a few of us are based here, right across the street. And uh, we build um, technologies and tools uh, for processing human languages and, and different capabilities in, in different languages. And specifically, I will talk about um, named entity recognition, um, which is about finding names of uh, people, organizations, locations, and some other related types in um, running text, completely unstructured, uh, written in different languages. So we work in a highly uh, in a multilingual uh, environment. Uh, so here is an example. According to Elon Musk, Mars rocket will fly short flights next year. I don't know if it's true, but definitely Elon Musk is a person and Mars is a location and next year is a date entity. So we have like uh, a few entities here. And this is the kind of the results that we expect to see from um, a named entity recognizer. Uh, given this text. Now, maybe some of you will think that it uh, could be a simple task. Maybe we could just compile a list of uh, location names from Wikipedia or something, and then um, use a very simple um, lookup procedure to find all instances of that list in the text, and that's it, maybe. But you wouldn't know whether Mars is mentioned as the location, right, or the candy bear. So we kind of really need the, um, the context to help us resolve this kind of ambiguities. We don't know that it's actually a location. Okay, so context is important. Uh, so this, this is just a fun exercise. Uh, yes. Uh, so give me an example. Mars isn't actually a location. What's the name? It's a, <laughs> it's a candy bear. Okay. Yeah. Also, the name are I mean, they're all entities anyway. Right, but not a location. So, and, and it's a good point. So, um, a recognizer will identify the entities and will tell us the type of the entity too. So we'll say that it's a location, like highlighted in red there, or a person entity, or a candy bar if you like. So a product, let's say. Cool, so, yeah. I think uh, it's supposed to be Mars rocket, because uh, it's speaking only about the Mars rocket, not about the Mars planet. Yeah, you could. You could uh, uh, say that. It, it really depends on how you decide to, you know, how to, what's your guidelines in annotating text. You could say that it's actually the rocket and not Mark. So there's, this is another challenge that we have with named entity recognition. So how you actually, um, what's your guidelines when you do the annotations and decide what is an entity and what's not. You can decide that it's a location and anything related to lo the location, you, you're not, you don't care about like rockets, you care about locations and then you can use that somehow. It really depends. Um, but that was just an example, right? So um, this is just a fun exercise. I don't know if you're familiar with it, um, but you know, to anyone here who don't, so just uh, it's for you. Um, so it's the checker shadow illusion. And just to show you that context is important sometimes, um, look at the squares represented by A and B and try to confirm that they actually have the same background color. Do you know this? Who, who saw this before? About half. Okay, so it's actually the same color and um, probably people who don't know this will think that B is actually lighter than A, uh, but it's, it gets darker by the that, that shadow that is dropped by the green element and it's the context surrounding B uh, that makes us believe um, you know, that B is a light box uh, within this board, so therefore it has to be, um, you know, lighter than A. But you can cover everything else and you will see it immediately, if you don't believe me. Okay, so uh, it's also important, context also important for, um, you know, for human languages. So check out this sentence, can't play Spain, improve your playing via easy step-by-step -step video lessons. So Spain here is not a name of a country. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a jazz standard um, written by Chi Korea. So it's not the name of a location. So it is an entity, but again, not a location. So that's the problem we're dealing with. Okay, so in order to capture the context, we use uh, machine learning. And this is why we're here, we'll talk about it. And, um, and we handle this problem as a sequence labeling problem. It means that we process word by word 
uh, and for every word we predict uh, a single label. Now remember that um, um, you know names may span across multiple um, words like Tel Aviv or New York, right? So we have different uh, you know positional labels for uh, for every entity type like B pair, I pair. So B pair would be the first word of a um, uh, named entity of, of a person type, and then I pair would be the second word and on. And then similarly, B lock, I lock, and so on. Other will be for um, words that are not part of a named entity. So you can see here uh, an example. I'm working for basis technology. I'm working for all the four words are O's, right? They're not names. And then basis technology is an organization. So B org is beginning and so on. So it's really like uh, sequence labeling where the inputs are words. Um, this is how we treat it. And this is the, the way that we usually uh, see the annotations. This is how we require the annotations to look like in a training set where we want to use it for, for doing training. We call it also IOB, right? Uh, inside, outside, beginning annotation. OK, so we're going to do machine learning now. Um, so let's briefly discuss the difference between a traditional machine learning, what we're doing at Basis for many years, and what we started to do re uh, recently, deep learning. And this is specifically uh, for, uh, for NLP. And the difference here is in our own perspective. Um, so for example, uh, by the way, this is the example that you see here is not named entity recognition, but it doesn't really matter. It's a different NLP task. This is sentiment analysis. But it doesn't matter. I mean, the input is the text, and the output is a label or collective of labels. It doesn't really matter. Now, with a traditional machine learning algorithm, the input is the text. And then the first step will be feature extraction or feature engineering, right, where we actually try to extract features from the input. Um, in NLP, we typically start by breaking the text into words. Um, now, breaking text into English words, it's pretty simple. Uh, but Chinese, for example, right? So you don't have uh, spaces between words. Japanese, Korean, all these languages are pretty um, difficult, more challenging, and you need to use specific tools, language-specific tools that by themselves are built over um, machine learning models. Um, once you extract words, you can extract more linguistic features like part of speech tags, if you like, uh, lemmas. Those are base form of words without all the prefixes, suffixes, like in Hebrew, right? It's very effective for a highly inflected language like Hebrew and Arabic, uh, for example, Spanish. And more features, we won't uh, discuss all the different types. But once we extract all these features, we can use them and put them together into a mathematical representation, like a vector, and then use that as an input for um, you know, traditional machine learning, uh, like uh, anything that you're familiar with. Uh, you know, for building a model, like a training procedure, build a model and then use the same representation to do the prediction. Uh, with the deep learning approach, um, there is no feature extraction really, right? We go directly from text to the mathematical representation and we use embeddings to do that. Now, there are different types of embeddings, like we have the, those static uh, word embeddings, we have all these contextualized embedding um, devices. And I won't, I won't talk about these uh, in this talk, but I'll say a few words about you know, static embeddings in the next slide just to give you the context. Um, but those are just fixed size vectors for now, and we use them as, you know, we, we plug them in uh, uh, into the deep learning model that we use. It's basically a deep neural net with many layers and different configurations and architecture, whatever you want to use right there. And that's it. So I would say that, I mean, if I'm, if I'm using a traditional machine learning, I should focus mostly on the part where I do feature extraction. Uh, and again, if I'm, I need to support 22 or 23 languages, which this is the number of languages that we support. So it's, it's a lot of work and it's very complicated to build all these tools like Lemmatizer for different uh, um, languages. Um, and on the other hand, with deep learning, I will focus mostly on configuring and designing the network. And I mean, if it works for English, it, wor it may work just as good for other languages, not always, with some tweaks, but generally speaking, it does. So in that sense, deep learning is a, more, it's, it's a much more generic approach for NLP, and for us, it's, it's good news. Um, so just um, you know, uh, to, uh, to touch base on the um, word embeddings uh, part, um, to the people who are not familiar with this, 
So those are fixed size vectors that you can train ahead of time if you like, right? And uh, intuition, how you build it is that, I mean, it, when you build it, you have like, a, if you have two similar words in their meaning, like a car and a truck, let's say, so their corresponding vectors will be similar too, right? In the sense of cosine similarity or any other uh, mathematical distance uh, uh, function. Uh, so you can, and then you can do things like that. You can take the vector of Japan, uh, subtract the vector of Tokyo, if you like. This is like an element-wise linear operation and then add the vector of Berlin. It's another uh, vector. You get a new vector. And uh, so you took the country, removed the capital uh, city, added another capital city, and then you get a new vector, which is not part of your vocabulary, but it will be very similar to the vector of uh, Germany in your vocabulary. And that's pretty cool. And this is the kind of calculations that happen inside a neural net, right? So you insert vectors, and then there are some you know, different gates and operators that take place and calculate all these things, like linear operations as well as nonlinear operations. And at the end, you get a, a result. And you train all this all together. All right, so um, a simple feed-forward network for named entity recognition looks something like that. Very simple. And I'm, I, I do assume some background, but I will go over this. Um, so we said that we process word by word. Um, for example, we want to predict the label for the word Spain right here in blue. So what we do, uh, we want to predict the label. We'll take its vector right here. That's the vector of Spain. And in order to capture the context with a feed-forward network, we simply ca capture the context by considering, like, let's say, the vector of two words before and two words after. That's it, OK? Or three. It's a, a fixed size window, right, the surrounding context. So you take all these vectors, put them one next to each other, or concatenate them, right? So you get a long vector. You use it as an input for a feed-forward neural net with many layers, as many as you want, and the output layer will have to be of the size of the number of labels that you have in your, uh, in your data set. So if you only care about people, organizations, locations, like PLO, uh, so you'll have about seven different labels, right? Uh, two for each and uh, one for other. Um, and it works surprisingly well, okay? But you can do better than that. Um, and you, you see, no feature engineering, nothing. You do need to break the text into words, right? That's one thing. And uh, then you need to have some you know, embedding library that you can use, and it works. Um, but the limitation here, obviously, is, uh, is what? What do you think the limitation is? Huh? Label data is always a limitation, yeah. <laughs> but in terms of this uh, model, so it's, it's about the context. We, we only capture like two words before, two words after. What if the evidence for a word to be detected as a name uh, is not here, it's somewhere else in the sentence, right? So in order to capture that, we may use a recurrent neural network, which is better for this kind of uh, um, cases, um, or RNN, and that's a vanilla RNN. Uh, so here we take the vector Spain, we send it directly to the first uh, layer here, and then instead of taking the vector of the, you know, the immediate context, what we do is this. We take the output from this layer, from the first layer, after it got modified with all the weights and everything that we learned during backpropagation, we take this output vector and we push it again into, like it's a, a feedback loop, uh, so we push it again into the, that layer, but concatenated with the vector of the following word. Meaning, when we want to predict the label for Spain, we send its own vector and the output vector from the previous word. That's what's happening here. And then the same output vector goes into the final uh, um, layer of the network for doing the prediction. By the way, that final layer is typically using softmax just to calculate the distribution across all the labels in the output. Um, so, and you can actually visualize it this way. Some people will find it better to look at this this way. We just unfolded the network, right? And you can see a time t right there. Um, so we take the word at time t, like the position t in the sentence after we break the text into a list of, uh, of words. We take the vector of the word t, we send it into the layer, um, the, the, the first layer, the fully connected layer. Together, what you see right here, um, that's the output layer, the, sorry, the output vector from the previous time step. And then the output vector will go into prediction and also to the following layer. I mean, the same layer, but for the following word. So you see that information flows from the beginning of the sentence 
throughout the entire sentence and every word in its turn can benefit from all that information. So all the context from the beginning of a sentence is flowing and every word can benefit and also can contribute more information to that vector. So this vector gets modified all the time, every time it uh, uh, passes a uh, uh, word gate. Now, it turns out that it remembers too much information. Uh, and it gets overwhelmed pretty quickly with the large amount of information it needs to store. We mathematically, we call this a gradient, uh, a vanishing gradient problem, exploding gradient problems. We won't get into that, but intuitively, it's just too much inf information. Sometimes we need to forget some of that information and be able to make room for more information to be stored. So there is a, a nice uh, flavor, uh, specific flavor of RNNs called long short term memory, uh, LSTM, very popular and go to technology for doing um, sequence labeling. And instead of using a single uh, fully connected layer here, we use um, like a more complicated uh, node with a few more layers inside. I won't go into all the details, but you can get all the, this information online pretty quickly. Uh, it's very popular. What, ha what happens here is the same information flows from the beginning of the sentence. And, um, and here it's just uh, every time the vector crosses uh, this node, it can also lose some of the information to make room for more important information to be captured. Okay, so this is the picture how it looks, right? So uh, the words uh, get into the network, but sometimes the information comes from the right-hand side, right? So here, let's say here, Chicago, I can only benefit from information that comes from uh, the beginning of sentence, but not from the other side. So we typically use another, um, another such process, LSTM process, we call this bi-directional LSTM, um, and those are two independent processes. Um, and then typically we have like two vectors that one goes from here and one goes from here to output vectors. We concatenate them and use that double side vector as an input for the final layer for doing the prediction, similar as what we did before. Uh, let me give you a few more tips of how you can extend this. You can maybe extend it with another layer of LSTM or bi-directional LSTM if you like, or another one if you like. So you, you get more, more parameters, as many as you like, and obviously that will be a huge monster and uh, it will take time to train and it will take also time to predict. And it's, you, you take a risk of overfitting for sure. So you need to take some measures here to um, avoid overfitting. Um, and one last, um, I have two more. Uh, suggestion for so one is instead of using the simple softmax prediction or decoding, um, use something else like uh, CRF, conditional random field um, enhanced version of HMM, uh, because this simple softmax won't, co won't consider the label that was predicted for the previous word. And, and there are some rules here, right? For example, I pair can only happen after B pair, right? So, and nobody enforced that for now. With the CRF or HMM, we can enforce these kind of things, right? And I won't go into details because we don't have much time, but that's another trick that people do usually, and, um, and it works pretty well. It adds a few minor points to the result according to our tests. Uh, last thing, as I promised, this is the character-based encoding. So, so far, we only encoded, we only considered words and information, but there are important information in characters like uh, capital letters, right, for English. It's very important, it's, it's a good indicator. We want to capture that, we want to use that information. So we can use like another LSTM uh, model similar like this, but on the character level. And, but here we don't need to do predictions like we did here. So we don't need to use these output vectors for every character. We can use the output vector from the last character, both sides, and use that um, representation vector as you know, as uh, the, the vector that represents the information about the characters for every word. We concatenate it with the uh, word level vectors that we have, and like these three vectors together represent a single word, and it works pretty well for different languages. Um, yeah. You do lemmatization before you do that? Right? Lemmatization? Yeah, before you do that. Typically, we don't do that. Uh, we, we just go with the raw data and don't do, we don't, we're not trying to do any feature extraction at that part, uh, point of time. Um, because the, the, the system will learn automatically. That's the thing. 
Um, so here are some results that we tried in our lab. So we try uh, to train a deep learning model, the same one that you just saw with a few more tweaks maybe uh, for different languages. Here I show you only English, Arabic, and Korean. And we compared it to a traditional machine learning model that we are using at basis for about 15 years or something. So uh, you can see that with no feature extraction, anything like that, we uh, were able to improve results across the board, all languages, and that's pretty exciting for us. If you want to use the models, uh, you can go to Rosette, developerrosette.com. Rosette is the name of our product, so it's not the same with the company. But uh, you could go there, and uh, you can open a free account if you like, and get a free quota, and we have like a cloud service or on-prem. And then you can, um, uh, you know, install our Rosette API um, package binding for Python. And then you can start um, sending text and get back the results. It's pretty easy and it works for 22 languages. Um, Japanese, Arabic, Hebrew included. Uh, of course, English, all the European languages, a few Asian languages and so on. Um, and the output will look exactly the same, the format. Um, so there are a few flags here. You can um, say that you want to calculate salience. I told you that we have a few more tweaks. So like calculate salience, whether the entity is important in the document or not. So we have a few more models there. Uh, we have a linker, something that will link the entity to its um, a potential uh, identity in a knowledge base. Uh, if you like, we also use there another model to do that. And here you can decide whether to use our deep learning model based on LSTM or the traditional one, which is the default model. Um, and then, for example, you can run you know, this text and run it through the system and get these kind of results, like a format as JSON. I only put here part, part of it. So you see that the first one is a node. Uh, the first node is an entity. And you can uh, see exactly where it was uh, mentioned in the document, character offsets. And then, you know, the, the text itself, uh, confidence, and on top here, entity ID, you can see that it was linked to, um, to a knowledge base. Basically, we use Wikipedia by default, but you can change that to use your own knowledge base if you like. Um, and this, the type is organization. So that's the SEC, if you're familiar with it. Last thing I want to cover in this talk. Um, so it's a little bit about the LSTM as a black box, because we talked about it before. Uh, we said uh, with a traditional machine learning, you create features and then you send them into a machine learning algorithm and then you learn something. Um, and then you can sometimes measure how effective the, the features that you extracted uh, for, you know, for the, the, the learning task that you were assigned for. Here, it's a bit more complicated because we don't have any features to measure, right? We didn't create any features. But in fact, if you look at the network, you can look at it as if here there is a feature generator, right? Because a vector will go right here, but two vectors, doesn't matter. Here, it will go here, a vector into the final layer. So you can consider this as a linear classifier with a vector that goes into the input of that layer. So this is like a vector of feature that were generated together, together with the learning task altogether, all right? Using the back propagation. So if we look at this vector specifically, it's the same vector here, here, it doesn't matter. But if we look at this vector and the number of uh, dimensions in this vector will be as, you know, as much as you want. This is like a hyper parameter for the model, right? It's like uh, uh, we use typically 500 dimensions. We also call them neurons, right? So 500 neurons, for example. So if we look at this vector of 500 numbers that will go through, um, you know, will travel through the sentence, the input sentence, and will get modified uh, after every word, we might learn something maybe. Now, it's, uh, it's gonna be a difficult task, but we built this tool. So this tool, it's a very simple one that takes a model that we already trained, and you can write a sentence right there, and you see it, it was broken into words, and then every word is here, and here you see the label that was predicted for that word. All of the words here were O's, and um, because they are not names, right? Now, if you see, and, and then what you what you see here, so every line here is a single neuron, the activation of that vector, and I colored here everything um, so it will be easy to detect patterns by eyeballing the, the data, right? Um, so every number here, every vector is a neuron, is a single neuron. 
So if you look at it, for example, here there is a pattern, something goes negative. The numbers, by the way, are between minus one and, and one because the output of LSTM activation vector is just, uh, it's just like that. It uses a gate, a specific gate that does that, tan H if you're familiar with it. Um, okay, so we ran many sentences here and looked at them manually to see if we we'll understand anything. 99.9% .9 of the time we didn't understand anything. It's just features that are not interpretable for humans, at least not for, for me. Um, very late at night, usually. Anyway, but if you look at this, um, we found something. 280, uh, the neuron 280, when we send many sentences throughout this neuron, you can see that it gets positive values when it sees punctuation marks. So obviously this is a feature that the system needed in order to detect um, entities, right? So that's an example, just to look inside what it actually learned. And another example is this one, if you like, uh, neuron 189 with the, uh, every time it sees the word in, which I think it's a good indicator for a location, right? Uh, so it will start to get negative for a few words of time. Um, so here you see I live in New York, that's the input sentence, and it, you see that the neuron gets negative right here, and the output labels were correct. So this is a GPE, but it's a geopolitical <coughs> entity, it's a location organization together, right? Um, so it, it was detected correctly, and so it helps probably for doing the detection, I don't know. But here, I live in a van. It's not a named entity. The system was correctly um, labeled those words with O's, but still we got negative values, right? So the system can benefit from this feature, but, can, but it knows to ignore it when it's necessary. Uh, the last thing I wanted to show you here, I live in a van and I have a new guitar. So you can see that this neuron uh, gets negative here, and at some point, it's just starting to forget, right? And go, goes back to the original value around the zero. So that's a property of LSTM, right? A property of information that is stored for some times, and then we know sometimes that we don't need this information anymore. It didn't help throughout the training process. After so many words, like four or five words, we just don't need this information, well, it won't help us. So we start to forget that, and not to be distracted by this information. And with that, I'm done. Questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we have a comparison with the uh, Amazon, Google, or one of the K if, if you compare the results? Um, we do that sometimes, but remember that comparing is very difficult because some, you know, some different tools, different uh, capabilities are sometimes built on different guidelines. We started with this, actually. It was, it's, yeah, it was a good thing to start with. So when it's, you know, different guidelines, it's very difficult to compare. Sometimes we do that, yeah. yeah. You have your own label, labels or... Label data, yeah. you mean? Do the label yourself or outsource? It depends. So, uh, depends on the language, right? And, um, yeah, so we, we do have partners that we work with and we outsource some of the labeling. Some we did ourselves with annotators, but mostly with, you know, we, with partners, but we define the guidelines, which is the, probably the most difficult problem we ever touched here, more than the neural nets, okay? So it's very difficult, something very difficult to agree on and make sure that all your uh, annotators do the same. So we have partners that we, you know, uh, go a long way um, together and uh, we work with them. Yeah. Do you apply any type of transfer learning from easy languages to... Uh, from easier language, so, yeah, that's, that's a good, uh, um, yes, so we have ideas, but we, di we didn't do anything with that. It's, yeah, it's, it's very interesting, like through maybe multilingual embeddings, that's definitely something on the radar, but didn't do anything, yeah. Thanks so much again. Thank you.